This is a clip from AFC North Talk, a show where me, Jared Bailey, who represents the Pittsburgh Steelers, SCG Sports, who represents the Baltimore Ravens, and Ace Boogie, who represents the Cincinnati Bengals, meet every week to talk about not only our teams, but get immersed into the world of everybody else's team. So if that sounds like a fun concept for a podcast for you, check it out. AFC North Talk. I did a video last week because I was on the road. I couldn't come in and talk about this game, but I did feel like the Browns had a better chance to score in this game than any other one simply because they switched out quarterbacks. Now, I went back, listened to what Jared had to say, and he said about the similar things. Now, you would expect that people would respect that we came to these conclusions as professionals who, you know, have some basis for this understanding. But boy, oh boy, when I read the responses, it was, oh, Quincy's coping. Oh my God, Quincy is being super hopeful about this situation. And look what happened. Look what happened. Did the MVP get outplayed by Jameis Winston on Sunday? I mean, three touchdowns, 330 yards. You can shake your head, know it all you want. Hey, what, Jameis almost threw interceptions? So did Lamar. Lamar so. almost had like four of them too, right? Two, they two, were both two, two. they were both graced by the glory of nobody catching any of them damn interceptions. And so this is to say, I'm accepting all the apologies right now. You have a 10 minute window to send in your apology to me. You guys were very mean to me. It hurt my feelings. I was very <laughs> sad, you know, so send your apology in right now. I want it to be just as loud as the disrespected. You know what? I wasn't the only one getting disrespected. Jared was getting dis. You know what? Tag Jared in. This is the one time that Stiller fans and Browns fans are going to come together on this. By the way, I enjoyed that little uh, CM Punk Hangman page reference. It was subtle, <laughs> but I, I saw it. It was good. Um, yeah, I mean, I was pretty, uh, you know, I heard, you know, Sonny and Ace talk about the game. And, you know, I just kind of full chest had said the Browns are the Browns are going to win. And the reason was simple, but it's the same thing we've talked about on here all year is just that the quarterback was holding them back. And if they got a real quarterback into the offense, things could turn around and lo and behold against a Ravens defense that hasn't been great this year and has been susceptible to giving up big plays. They gave up big plays. Look, I'm not the most superstitious person in the world. I'm not the most spiritual person in the world, but we got to acknowledge how things just magically start bouncing our way. Once the Sean Watson ain't in there at quarterback anymore. Like we got incredible luck in that game. He did exactly what you expected him to do. He put the ball downfield. He gave guys opportunities to make plays. I make this joke all the time about Jameis. Jameis going to give every, all 22 players on the field a chance to win the game, <laughs> right? Like that's what Jameis going to do. Everybody's going to have a chance to make a play when Jameis is out there. So, and Jameis did exactly that. He gave David and Joku a chance to make a play on Eddie Jackson's back there in the end zone. Same thing happened at the end of the game with Cedric Tillman, who just, I, Eddie Jackson can't be out there anymore for the Ravens. Like, I, I think that part is obvious. I don't know why he's still out there. He's bad, bad. But yeah, I feel much better about the Browns. That was the funnest Browns game to watch all season. And it's crazy how just changing the quarterback, it felt like watching the game from 2023. Like, I swear to you, these 2024 games have felt so lackadaisical from the start. And in this game starts, I'm like, oh, no, it seems like everybody's excited to play. And I know everybody in that locker room defended Deshaun Watson to the death after he got booed um, on his way out. But y'all lie it. Y'all lying, dog, because <laughs> I can tell y'all were more excited for this game this week. Like, couldn't you just see it tangibly when you're watching the Browns? Yep. I saw Elijah Moore catch a one-handed ball this week. <laughs> he ain't done nothing like that all season. No, Jerry Duty was running really hard. Like, yeah. I, it, it seemed like they had a better, uh, better confidence of what they were able to do and execute this week in practice versus what they've seen with the shot. And Qu question that I have in that in that case, Q is, do you think the team now looks as Stefanski says? Because we talk about this, how Stefanski said we had the guy that gives us the better chance playing, right? I, I, that was an exact word, this is a phrase, right? And you see Jameis Winston playing and actually giving you a chance winning the game. If you're the team, you're like, but and, and Kevin not calling place either in this case. So it was a two. Well, right. I think there's two things here. There's three things here. One, because there's so much time left in the season, mm -hmm. I don't think that's immediately where players minds go. 
Okay. Which is they're still thinking we can still make the playoffs, right? So okay. he's gonna dodge that bullet just because of that. I also think optically, now I don't think this is true, but the optics on this from outside looking in is that Kevin Stefanski was handcuffed and, and had to start Deshaun Watson, right? And I think that's kind of got what it, the it. view is with inside the building of the players, at least. I don't think that's true. I think Kevin, if he really wanted to put his foot down, he could have put his foot down and do it, but he kind of just played ball with it. But that's going to be the perception is, hey, well, you couldn't just match him. He's making $230 million. Um, players are pretty understanding of the of the money part of the game and how that affects uh, decisions, right? It's kind of like why the locker room wasn't kicking and screaming when Russ got put as a starter because they kind of understood like, okay, well, he was going to get a chance, right? So... Yeah, I don't think the locker room's going to look at him crazy. I think just people in the media are going to look at him crazy. But if he wins enough games, nobody's going to give a fuck at the end of the day. Okay. Anymore, we talk about that a couple of weeks. Look, the thing with Deontay Johnson, in my opinion, Jared, I'll, I'll let you also speak because I know he played with you guys for a while. When Deontay Johnson's on his game in a game setting, he's he can be really, really good. The problem is there's other games that he can be really, really bad. Um, in the case of Baltimore, you're not trading to just – him be the guy, right? He can be our second, third, right? Because the tight ends have been playing better. Mark Andrew has been, been playing better. So you're not bringing him to depend on Deontay Johnson. So I, again, I think the room got better, but Gary, what do you think? No, I mean, I, I, I think that I'm a Deontay Johnson guy. I enjoyed you know watching him play and whatnot, but there's a reason why he's been dealt for a bag of buttons twice. And I think it's just because behind the scenes, it's just it can get a little bit ticky tacky. So, by the way, if you want something to really laugh at, uh, the Carolina Panthers uh, in total basically traded two sixth round picks and Dante Jackson, who's got three interceptions for the Steelers in exchange for eight weeks of Deontay Johnson and the Ravens fifth round pick. So not yeah. not the best well run organization over there. <laughs> but um, but I know I think Deontay Johnson obviously gives the Ravens, you know, another option in the offense to uh, to. You know, spread the ball around and make plays. So I think it'll be an overall net positive. And if it's not, then they didn't really give up anything uh, to begin with. I do wonder with this move, right? Like, there is a lot of potential for it to work out, I think. Yeah, and it's like, what what are we going to see from him? How is he going to be happy in Baltimore? Um, Look, Lamar is known for getting visually frustrated, visibly frustrated Mm -hmm. at these wide receivers. Um, Is that going to be something that he reacts well to? Is that going to be a clash of personalities there? And also, like, the one thing that seems to drive Lamar crazy is drops, right? Like, every time he gets these drops, he loses his mind. And I'm not saying Deontay uh, is just going to drop everything, right? And, like, he's not going to catch a single thing. Right. But he will but drop one. There will be a time yeah. where he drops something. And Lamar is going to be pissed. And what's going to happen after that moment is kind of how this trade will be judged. Because I think Jared brings up a good point. Two teams have decided, t- have given up him for here, take it trades. Like, here. Have yeah. Like, huh, just take him, bro. We're done. That can't be great. Like, what did he do in eight weeks to piss everybody off in Carolina? I thought he was playing well. The last time we checked in, he was yeah. playing well. Like the last I, month I, I or think so. they were trying to get something, to be honest. I, I don't know. I, that's but sound. if you're trying to get something, you hold out longer than getting a fifth or a sixth round pick spot. That is a here, take them deal. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. a nah, sure. man. We're just going to, you want them? Okay, yeah, we'll work something out to make sure that you can get them, right? Like, kind of moves. Because I guess they didn't have any suitors they felt comfortable giving to that were in conference. Um, but, yeah, it is it, it is a bit concerning, like, the circumstances of this trade. The player is clearly talented. Um, I think the consistency is where you worry about that. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, there's some kind of element behind the scenes with him. Um, because like we didn't all this talk about George Pickens being a terrorist and all of that, like the Steelers are stuck with them, <laughs> right? Like through all of this stuff. But Deontay Johnson, man, Pittsburgh, who's known for like kind of hanging around with these dudes a little bit longer than most people would, they were like, nah, dog, we're not gonna do it. And I just wonder what's going on with that. When Chase has nine catches, usually it's a hundred attached to the nine catches. Mm-hmm. Um what do you think it went wrong in this game? Uh, I mean, this game was frustrating to watch because Bengals started the game out on fire. I mm-hmm. mean, Joe Burrow was going down the field. 
Bro, they um, took like team. 10 minutes on the first drive. 10 yeah. minutes on the first drive. No T. Higgins coming into the game like a late scratch. So, like, mm -hmm. I was somewhat worried, especially based off of what we saw when similar things happened uh, at the home opener. Like, T. Higgins was a late scratch in that one. They didn't really have a plan. And so, with him being out Friday, I'm just like, man, what are they going to do? Because he's been in installs all week. Like, what are they going to pivot to? And I love what Zach Taylor tried to do, at least like on that first drive, he put in Mike Gusecki. He kept Jamar Chase in the slot because teams are just going to bracket Jamar Chase if you don't have T. Higgins out there. He finally put in Jermaine Burton. I've been clamoring, like, why aren't we playing Jermaine Burton for weeks now? He finally puts Jermaine Burton in. Um, Joe's out there executing. The run game just could not get started whatsoever, but the first drive was good, 10-minute drive. They go down. Um, Jamar Chase dunks. They get up on the board. They go down and stop the Eagles. They force a punt and get the ball back. I um, mean, then they start to settle for three. And I'm like, all right, I don't, I don't know if this is what we should do against the Philadelphia Eagles because at one point they're going to wake up. They have Saquon Barkley. They have AJ Brown. They have Devonta Smith. They have Jalen Hurts. And so the Bengals get into a position where I feel like, all right, you can almost take Saquon out of this game mm -hmm. if you get up by two scores. Um, and Zach Taylor, once again, on a fourth and seven, where Burrow was cooking and the offense was cooking, decided to do the same thing that he did a few weeks ago and have uh, Evan McPherson, who you know is struggling at this point, kick another 50-yard field goal. Uh, of course, he misses the field goal, and it seemed like to me – from then on, the momentum just went to Philadelphia. Like all of them, all of the monsters, energy or whatever, got sucked into the Philadelphia Eagles basketball. And from then on, the Bengals just honestly got boat race. Um, the the defense started to collapse. They couldn't hold up. Um, these Eagle guys were just running wide open. They could not get to Jalen Hurts whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Fred Johnson had Trey Henderson in a, in a phone booth, dog. Like, I couldn't understand it. Like, I get that they were chipping. I get that they tried to use some double teams. But for the most part, he had about 13 reps one-on-one -on -one with Fred Johnson. Wasn't able to do anything about it. And honestly, like, these are the same old kind of issues that we've heard in Cincinnati before. There is no one that can rush the passer outside of Trey Hendrickson. If Trey Hendrickson isn't getting to the quarterback, nobody's getting to him. They had three pressures in this game, dog. Like, Jim Hurts could have made a Philly cheese steak, went to New York, came back, and then made a pass to Calcaterra, of all people, that was eating the Bengals secondary up in this one. Bengals secondary has been an issue. We knew that coming in. Um, they didn't do anything to dispel that. They actually did a really good job against Saquon up until about, like, the fourth quarter. Second half of the game, Saquon started doing his thing, um, mm -hmm. and the Bengals just didn't have anything offensively. Some of the Zach Taylor masterclass decisions that we started to see on offense just really didn't make sense. He ends up going for it on a fourth and one, and an obvious, uh, obvious kind of goal line formation um, on third and one, where it's like, oh, it's it's clear that the Bengals are going to run the ball here. It's just repeated mistakes of things that we've seen from the past that Zach Taylor continues to do. Um, that don't make sense. And then on a fourth and one, you're going to give Jamar Chase the ball in the backfield, like behind the line of scrimmage, and you you thought that that was going to work. Um, there were some things that were frustrating in this game before it started to get to that point. The Bengals actually stopped the tush push. I yep. feel like they stopped it twice. The refs felt def differently, even though they circled like a man's elbow <laughs> yeah. on, the, on the replay. <laughs> and we're like, true. yeah, he got in. I'm like, I guess we're counting elbows now. But, I mean – you know, they just got boat raced in the second half, bro. This defense gave up 27 points in the yeah. second half, and you just can't have that. Joe Burrow did have the interception. I think that that was honestly just a great play uh, by that Eagles defender to be able to deflect it and then for that uh, that corner to be able to make a play on. Or I think it may have been. It was C.J. Gardner-Johnson. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was C.J. Gardner-Johnson. So the safety to be able to make the heads-up play there. And once they did that, it was game over. And and so, like, what we've seen now from this Bengals offense, even in the Browns game, they are just up and down, and they are super inconsistent. And people don't know what the hell Zach Taylor is doing. The defense isn't good. isn't good enough to stop anybody. Um, and so when you get a combination of both of these components of the team not being on the same page, the result is what you ended up getting on Sunday. And it's crazy because they started the game out 
on the same page. And as the game went on, as soon as one lost some kind of momentum, the other one did. And the next thing you know, it's a blowout. Yeah. Like I w- It went from me being like, all right, this is a game. Bengals look like they're in control of it to, oh, my God, this is a blowout now. Like We're getting smoked now. So a lot of people are looking at Zach Taylor, and they're just like, we don't understand this. Like There's no excuse for this. The decisions that are being made, nobody being open. Um, people are looking at the front office because it's like, okay, what did you really expect? And then you're sitting here expecting them to make some kind of move to try to add to the pass rush, whether that's a trade, whether that's trying to grab somebody off of someone else's practice squad. They're not even doing that. It's like, dog, Sam Hubbard is not doing anything. Sam Hubbard is a rag doll at this point. Like, how many times do you have to throw him out there? The kid from Clemson. How is he playing? Uh, I'm blanking his name. Miles Murphy. Uh, he's Murphy. not playing. They're not <laughs> playing them. The Bengals are doing this thing this year. Jermaine Burton, before this game, they put Jermaine Burton in. Guess what? He gets a 40-yard catch. Guess what? Mm-hmm. He takes three defenders off of off of, uh, off of our players and opens it up for Eric All to get a 20-yard reception. But for some reason, Zach Taylor and his staff don't think that they should play young players, even though it's clear that they need them. I don't know why Sam Hubbard is getting more snaps than Miles Murphy. It makes no sense. You just he can always force a fumble and get a 98 yard return. Maybe that's why he's there. I don't know. The Cincinnati kid needs to needs to. I don't know. He needs to grow up or something because they need to put that man on the bench somewhere. It's just a lot of stuff going on right now in Cincinnati from from a standpoint that doesn't make sense. Von Bell continues to get snaps even though he is washed. I don't know why they are putting Mm. him out there. Uh, and they're just not playing the young players. And what they've done is they've moved off of these veterans, these established players, and you try to sell us on, oh, well, you know, we'll just replace them with these young players, and then they're not playing. Right. So it, it doesn't really make sense. So you get a lot of mid-play on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and honestly, I expected the Bengals to be an offensive team and not a defensive team. Like, But you sold me on – you were going to keep T. Higgins. You were going to draft Burton. You were going to do all of these things. And now you're not keeping T. Higgins. So I don't know what the plan is for this team. They just interviewed Joe Burrow and asked him, like, hey, yeah, Bengals are going to make that. a trade? And he's like, that's not, not my, my job. And I can tell you, I don't think that they are. I don't think that they are. They have known for games now that this defense is not good. They know that they only have Trey Hendrickson and the Hendrickettes, and they're not doing mm-hmm. anything about it. So guess what? You get a defense where if Trey Hendrickson – isn't wrecking the offense, this is what you end up getting. And he's so a free agent too, right? No, he's not a free agent. He's got no. another year. Uh, okay. They won't extend him. They, he, that was his issue in the offseason. He wanted yeah. more years added, and the Bengals were like, yeah, we're not doing that. And I'm like, he's older. Yeah, He's the only player on your defense, dog. That yeah, is yeah. worth something. Um, but, I mean, right now in Cincinnati, it's starting to get ugly because now you're sitting at three and five. Now you have no room for error. You lost those games earlier in the season. You got the Raiders coming into the town. Like, if you let Gardner Minshew cook you on 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 defense and you cannot score over 20 points in this game, it's a problem. And, I mean, we've already, you guys already know I've talked about Zach Taylor's play calling, his scheme. It sucks. It's the same thing. You know, when the players aren't there to really bail him out, it is what it is. Joe Burrow's having an amazing year, but it's a waste of time. Like I don't, I don't care that Joe Burrow is number one in EPA or any of that stuff. If we're three and five and our defense can't stop a nosebleed, so it is what it is. It's a frustrating loss. Like if they would have been a little bit more competitive in this one, it's not as frustrating because I didn't walk into this thinking, oh, we're just gonna beat the Philadelphia Eagles. Like things yeah. had to go your way for that to happen. The run game is atrocious, 2.7 yards per carry. And I had people blaming Joe Mixon for this. Joe Mixon is in t- – in, uh, He's cooking in, there. Like playing like a top three running back, dog. He's playing mm-hmm. like a top three running back. And we've got Chase Brown and Zach Moss averaging two yards per carry because all they want to do Dukes. is one draw plays up the middle into a brick wall every time and expect for something to change. It is what it is at this point. Like – if they don't start winning and something doesn't happen, either lose going. If they if they go under 500 for the season, then I'll say they'll probably move on from Zach. But until that happens, we're just along for the ride. You think yeah. so, E? Let's talk about the Steelers. We have the Steelers and Mr. Wilson. Mr. Russ, I have been getting tagged. Like, there's no tomorrow. 
you see Tomlin was right. Let Russ cook. Russell's playing good. I mean, I cannot hear say that Russell's not playing good. The offense on the air is moving better. But somehow, too, their running game has gotten better with Najee. Ever since the Dasani comment came out. Ever since the Dasani. Yeah, Steelers fans. Steelers fans. Go give some some uh, some uh cards over there to Jerry. Because Jerry was the one that created the Dasani thing. And ever since that, Najee cannot run, rush for less than 100 yards. Now, I will say this. Offensively, still some kinks to work with the Steelers. But what the F did the special teams of the Steelers have? Like, uh, like I'm here. They can block. They block everything now. Field goals, punts, whatever. Now they can return to. I, my special team has been kind of trash lately. I know a special team because of the same, the kicker not playing well, not, not super consistent right now, but over there between Boswell and the special team units on the blocking side and on the return team, Gary, you have a squad in that, but people don't talk much about how do you start on this game? Yeah. So, um, I'll start with the offense. Russ built off of what was a good, I'd say last like two and a half quarters against the Jets and put together a really good game. Went 20 to 28, 278. Should have had three touchdown passes, but Roger Jones, being Roger Jones, got a face mask penalty on the first one. After they drove down the field on the first drive almost effortlessly, they ran a play action and Russ bulleted a touchdown pass to George Pickens. Roger Jones got a face mask. All right. Or a little hands to the face, I guess it would be offensively. So, all right. That came off the board. They settled for three. And then he threw another really good bottle to George Pickens in the end zone, who got two feet down, but not both feet down. So therefore it's not a touchdown and that gets taken off the board. It, there's a lot of things that happen where they should have, where I kind of got on them a little bit for finishing, but I couldn't be too angry at them in this game because they did finish. It just got wiped off for dumb reasons. So um, Russ played well, Najee Harris, three straight hundred yard games. First time in his career that he's done that he's playing incredible right now. Um, Jalen Warren is also continuing to be a really good compliment. He had over 40 yards on nine carries. So, I mean, he's been a really good number two, uh, to the offense right now. Um, Pickens, his normal dominant self, his numbers don't nearly show how good he was in this game, because like I said, he should have had two touchdowns. Um, but he had a 43 yard catch off a, like, I don't want to say like they got vintage Russ, but in this game, man, like there was some throws that Russ made. That I was like, all right, man, if you took away like the colors of the uniforms and whatnot to show me this game in black and white, and I saw that throw, I'd say, all right, that's like 2020 Russ right there. Like he looked good. Um, he had a throw to Van Jefferson of all people on third and eleven that got 36 yards and moved the moved the ball downfield, and they scored a touchdown on that drive. Uh, Calvin Austin had a 29 yard touchdown and a punt return touchdown. So. They're starting to get more plays from their playmakers um, in terms of the receiving group stepping up outside uh, of Pickens. Van Jefferson had four catches for 62 yards, by far his best game as a Steeler. Calvin Austin had his best game, the best game of his life, because um, he had the, the punt return touchdown and the receiving touchdown. Um, defensively is where I was worried this game. Uh, afterwards, at least going into the game, I thought our right, defense should eat here. Defense was the Achilles heel of this team on Monday night. They allowed four plays of 25 or more yards. Darius Slayton had two really long catches. Tyrone Tracy, by the way, I put out a tweet that everybody and their mother got butt hurt about. So I said, I'm tired of this defense giving up plays to like bad players. And I said, Rico Dowdle and Tyrone Tracy and every draft nut in the, in the world pushed up their glasses. Like, well, actually, Tyrone Tracy's not a bad player. I didn't uh, even know how Ty who Tyrone Tracy was. Oh, Tyrone Tracy was big in draft Twitter. So yeah, yeah so, so I had to listen to all the dorks with no with notebooks come at me saying, well, actually, at Purdue, he was quite good. Shut the fuck up, bro. He's not Eric Dickerson. That's the point <laughs> I'm making. Like, Jesus Christ. That that was the only thing I was saying. Like, it's not like they were giving up big plays to Barry Sanders in his prime. It's a fifth-round rookie, Tyrone Tracy, that got up 150 rushing yards against them. That's not a good sign, especially when you got to play Derrick Henry twice in the back end. you got to play Nick Chubb twice in the back end. That's not good. So I'm worried about that. And outside of that, I mean, it was somewhat unimpressive. Uh, TJ Watt had a big game. Alex Highsmith had a big game. Uh, but outside of that, man, the defense was less than impressive. They sat in the same, what looked like an, in, an inverted cover two, where they had the middle hook guy playing so far back, and that just opened up the middle of the field for a lot of checkdowns and 
yards after the catch, which extended a lot of drives. It was just they really... were scaring neighbors, is what it sounded look like. Even then, man, like they don't have like Darius Slayton had a nice game. Neighbors is yeah. there, but like Daniel Jones shouldn't scare you that bad. Where you just sit in like a very soft cover two look for especially the especially with of the, the left tackle being out, right? You yeah, that's what exactly. I said. And it and it took them forever to finally descend the heat. And once T.J. Watt got a one on one matchup and wasn't chipped, he took advantage of it and had the the trifecta of the sack strip and fumble and their fumble recovery um so he i mean t, excuse me tj Watt was his normal dominant self alex highsmith had really i mean i think he should have got credit like partial credit for one of watt's sacks because he had an amazing spin move off the edge that forced jones out of the pocket and watt came off the edge off his block and, and cleaned it up so um overall yeah i mean the defense was a little bit less than impressive patrick queen actually was Patrick Queen over the last month has looked like the Patrick Queen I thought that they were going to get. It took him a little while, but he's starting to really settle in. I thought he had a really good nose for the ball in this game. Um, it was covering a lot of ground. Re just looked really explosive. Uh, Beanie Bishop, another interception. That's his third in two games. Pretty sick. Um, they're getting Cameron Sutton back as well after the uh, the bye week. He's done serving his eight-game suspension, so they'll get a little bit of a boost in the secondary. Corey Trey should also be coming back. So. Um, they're six and two, they're leading the division and they're getting a lot of help and a lot of guys coming back. Nick Urbic should also be back from injury. Zach Frazier's coming back from injury. So, uh, overall, man, like I, if you would have told me coming into the season that the Steelers would be six and two at the bye week, I would have been ecstatic. And I am, um, credit to Russell Wilson, who continues to get better. There was multiple times they cut to him and fields on the sideline and it, like I tweeted out, I was like present and future. And I don't know if they're going to try to go the avenue of bringing both of them back, but they have more than enough money to do it. None of these guys are going to cost too much. And if you're Justin Fields and you have a chance to go play somewhere else, I totally get if you go and do that and bet on yourself, no hard feelings whatsoever. But I really hope there's a situation where they look at this and say, look, if Russ keeps playing like this, we want to keep him around for a couple more years, but also Justin, we want you here because we think that you could be kind of the heir apparent. So if there's a way that they can do that, I think that there is because they have a lot of free cap space going into this offseason where they could do it. Uh, hopefully they can do something like that. But yeah, offensively, man, it feels good to watch a game where the offense is the dominant force. And I'm like, all right, well, the defense isn't playing great, but the offense has picked up the slack. In previous years, they lose that game because uh, the defense would have been on the field too much. They would have asked the defense to do too much, and they would have had they would have ended up giving up more points, and they would have blown that game. But uh, credit to Arthur Smith, who continues calling really good games. Credit to Russ, who is really just finding his old self to a degree. And uh, yeah, the offense looks good. Defensively, I want to see a little bit better performance against Washington because if you play like that against Washington, Jane Dance is going to light you up for a lot of points. So I'm, uh, I'm very happy that Russell Wilson has made me eat a lot of crow the past two weeks and very happy with the performance of the offense and uh, Sonny brought up the special teams, best special teams in football, best special teams coordinator in football, Danny Smith eating 900 pieces of gum at one time. Uh, they're blocking field goals, they're blocking punts, they're returning kicks with touchdowns. Chris Boswell is the best kicker in football right now. So, you know, I came into the year and I said, I'm not going to put a label on the Steelers until about midway through the season where we know what the quarterback is because, you know, tell me how good the quarterback is and I'll tell you how far they can go. This is a team that can win a playoff game or two. Uh, they can be like those 2019 Titans who like kind of surprise some people and be like, why are the Titans in the AFC championship game? What the hell? And I think that if the matchups are right, they could have a run like that. I don't think they're a Super Bowl winning caliber team, but I think that they can win uh, a playoff game maybe too if the matchups are right. And and by the way, who who was the offensive coordinator for that Titans team? Arthur Smith. So a lot of connected tissue there. I feel really good about the Steelers right now. And in terms of, you know, they're going to have all of their divisional games. I mean, all all four of us are going to see a lot of, uh, you know, team versus team in the back end of the season because of how the schedule was, was played out. Um, so... Now you're six and two. You can afford to maybe lose a game that that is going to be tougher. You know they got Kansas City on Christmas. They got Philadelphia. Um, there's going to be a couple tough games down the stretch. Obviously the divisional games, but it it looks like it's just a matter of what seed they'll have in the playoffs right now. Not so much a question of if they'll make it at all. So that's a good spot to be in in week eight. And uh, as a fan, I feel pretty good. Cute. Yeah, I was watching this game, and I had this feeling in my stomach. Mm. And halfway, well, not halfway through, I think in the third quarter, I take my glasses off and say to myself, my God, the Steelers are actually good. <laughs> 
it's actually happening. They're actually good. This actually worked out for them. Um, yeah, I mean, I watched them. The, the, Najee's running really well, and it's not really like good. fake good. Like it's like no, nah, he's breaking tag. He looks like Najee did at Alabama, like where he's doing all the extra shit and he's running. He's he's like has more of a burst. Like I don't know he what hurt, he hurt, old man. He, he yeah, he's he the cleanest hurdles you've ever seen. Maybe like his uh his wearing hair super finally, like reset and he's got all his attribute points again because like he looks like a different guy out there the last three weeks. I mean he looks like one of the better running backs in football right now. And I'm not a Najee Harris fan. Like I'm, I've always contended he was pretty generic. He does not look generic the last three weeks. Yeah. And this is against a heavy defensive line that you know showed up in this game versus Pittsburgh right Dexter Lawrence had a good game in this one it still didn't matter Najee was still able to kind of get his so and they well, they got Bobby Okariki who I think is a good linebacker too like this isn't a shabby defense in New yeah. York that the Steelers were doing this against and they could have had way more points right the first half they got nine points off of three what should have been three touchdown drives um to start this game? That Pittsburgh's just good. Their defense is good. They're not as good as I thought they were at the beginning of the season, but they're still a really solid unit, probably in the top ten of the league. Um, you know, they have a little bit of whole like of questions in the secondary, but other than that, like it's not really like they have bad problems in the secondary. It's not like they they were playing somebody. I'm like, oh man, they don't they don't want to play him, right? It's like, oh George right. Porter Jr. hold sometimes. Like it's it's you'll live with those problems. <laughs> um and then the George Pickens things, I look, I am never gonna be surprised about the whole George Pickens saga again because this always happens like this. Like right when he's at the breaking point with the team and the quotes are coming out he needs to get in line. He doesn't change anything behaviorally. He just goes out there and puts together like three 100-yard games out of four or some shit like that. And he's in the middle of doing that. Uh, George Pickens looks incredible. And I thought that him and Russ would pair well. Well, I'm surprised then with Russ being out there is that you're having that same level of success with the run game. I thought the run game was going to be affected, but Najee's picked up the slack from not having Justin uh, Justin Fields out there being able to run the ball. Nah, man, like this is a good team. I think they're a threat to win a playoff game this year. Um, you know, they are they might win the division. Who knows, right? Baltimore, I still think, is the better team. But Pittsburgh right now has the edge because they had the better start to the year. So we'll see how the season ends up for these guys, if Russ can still continue playing at these this level. But if this is what they're going to get, if this is the team that they're going to be on a regular basis – yeah, man, that, that looks like an 11 to 12 win team that's going to win a playoff game.